Thanks for coming. I'm Steve Bates. I'm CTO at Adeticom, and I'm also got a consulting company and all that jazz. But what I'm talking about today is a little more general than that. I, as a kind of pet passion of mine, I've been on this like four or five year journey now of making PCIe endpoints to DMAs to each other. And um, right now, I feel like we've gotten from the point where we, you know, with regards to the Linux community, we've got to the point where a lot of people see that there's potential value in this, and there are challenges around what it is that we're trying to do, but there's also so much potential benefit that um, you know, it feels like it's more a case now of working out how we get this upstream rather than whether it goes upstream at all, but we'll see. Uh, I do want to talk about the latest incarnation of our fork of the Linux kernel that is a framework for helping PCIe endpoints talk to each other, um, still under OS supervision, but, um, but on the data plane at least trying to keep the traffic away from the root complex and the, and the DDR. Um, so I'll talk about that, and, and then very nicely this also, at the same time as I've been working on this over the last few years, both within you know, people like Tom in the room here on the RDMA side, and, and then a whole bunch of us on the NVMe side, I've actually been looking at, you know, if we'd actually start to work within this framework, what are some of the interesting things we can do around persistent memory that could be protect, you know, potentially remote addressable that isn't an NVDMN? end. So, yeah. 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 Any better? Hello. Hello. No, yeah. I'm. I'm actually a. I'm actually. I'm actually. I'm actually a robot. Um, <laughs> that, could, that could be the issue. Yeah. Well, let's, yeah. let's plug ahead. You're yeah. Tiring. Yeah. No worries. Thank you. The. Um, so there's some interesting things that are happening there, and I've, we actually have um, some kind of advanced products, prototypes that we're using with things like controller memory buffers, and even now the new NVMe persistent memory regions. So we're actually in our lab starting to do some real. Remote, um, remote access, persistent memory over fabrics to PCIe attached memory on the target rather than just NVDIM type stuff. And I think that's kind of cool. So anyway, what's the rationale? Or no, a little bit of nomenclature. I always have to put in a picture of my kids. Um, my son coined the phrase blucky. It's the combination of blah and yucky. Um, but PCIe peer-to-peer -peer using P2P mem is, is not blucky. So it's actually pretty cool. Um, the rationale. We're drinking from a fire hose. I didn't have a fire hose, but it's a cute picture. This is not one of my kids, whatever. Um, you know, RDMA NICs are getting faster and faster and faster. I keep telling Adan to slow down, stop, stop, stop. But he's like, he's going, no, Stephen, no, no, Michael is beating my ass. You know, 50, you know, we were doing 10, we were doing 40, then Brad Booth and the 802.3 guys got smacked down, and they went 25 giga lane. Now we can do, you know, 25, 50, 100. 200's coming pretty soon. The NICs are incredibly fast, right? NVMe SSDs, a million IOPS per SSD. And Samsung gave a talk yesterday, and like we were looking at numbers, and they were like pretty big numbers, like you know, eight or nine gigabytes per second, but I went, hang on, that's only like half of the potential of those four or five SSDs. It was, it's very easy now to get a PCIe subsystem that's running multiple tens of gigabytes per second. Like easy, like flash array, throw in some graphic cards, throw in a couple of RDMA NICs, you're talking 20, 30 gigabytes per second. At the same time, we're starting to see the NVMe storage systems come on the market. New ISIS had a couple on show, Celestica, I don't know if you saw there, but they had some on show. So we're starting to be able to buy these hardware devices that can allow us to populate them with lots of endpoints. And all of that data is coming in at this incredible rate. And the CPU is like, I, Jesus Christ, guys, come on. No. You know, it's this, ah, and fall, you know, whatever. We basically have got to the point where even if it's only a couple of instructions per I.O., you're absolutely screwed. Right? You're just dead. Right? And, and there's not that much you can do in a couple of instructions per I.O. Right? So we've got to start thinking about how do we help the CPU out here and maybe let it focus on the important thing. Because the, the other problem that we have is... Uh, the second point on this slide, right now, certainly in the major OSs and for sure in Linux, 
Every single I.O. that's coming in on an RDMA NIC that has to go to an NVMe drive requires a bounce buffer that's in system memory. And that means that if you're doing 20 million IOPS, all those 20 million IOPS, and Adan showed his curvy diagram earlier today, it's like, it's part of why the reason why I'm so tired. It's like, every I.O. has to go to system memory and down to the drives. Every read has to come out of the drives, be DMA to system memory, and out through the RDMA NIC. If you have a graphics card that's sharing some stuff and you're not using out of tree kernel hacks like GPU direct, um, you know, it has to go through system memory. So the poor processor is like, I don't even want this effing data. Like, I don't even want it, and you're passing it through my root complex, and I have to pump it out through the integrated memory controller to the DDR, and then pull it back in the integrated memory controller. Push it out. I got threads here that are trying to make me some money. I'm like doing, I'm watching my Netflix movies. I'm like doing my FinTech. I'm checking the stock market. And, and, and those poor processors are doing load stores through the same integrated memory controller that's getting annihilated with like 20 gigabytes per second. And I'm sorry, memory bandwidths are pretty big, but fuck, that's, that's not cool, right? So the quality of service of the load stores that are being you know, done by the cores, they're, they're not, that, that's not good, right? So um, that's kind of the noisy neighbor problem. So, you know, we still like to have an operating system. There's some people who are moving away from, you know, having an operating system at all, but I think that's pretty insane because I kind of like being able to work out what happens when things go wrong. Um, so it's kind of nice to think about a paradigm where the operating system is still potentially, you know, it's still the management, it's still maybe issuing the I.O. requests and managing what happens when things go wrong and maybe servicing some interrupts and so forth. But the data path, if we can, keep it away from the root complex of the processor. Okay. So, there's many ways of solving that problem. Um, I've been looking at the Linux kernel specifically, um, and some of the other people in the room have. And you know, there's been a few different ways. I actually presented the same, this same kind of topic last year, but it was quite a different set of kernel patches than this one. And this one is maybe better. It's maybe worse, whatever. And there's a few people out there in the community who've kind of contributed or, or, or said, "Hell no, this is not getting in." And, that, and that's all fine because you know the kernel has an awful lot of people who care about it, and it does a lot of different things. And we have to be very careful about what we put in because once it's in, it's pretty much never coming out. So we want to make sure we get this right. Um, so this is just an, an example that we've proposed and we're discussing in the community, and maybe it'll go upstream, maybe something different to it will. But, but the, the main idea is really, right now in, in the Linux kernel, if you just pass a random 64-bit value down to the DMA API, it's probably pretty sensible for the kernel to do some checks on that, because, well, you may have just given it a completely random address. And the DMA engines that are in these NICs and whatever, they have no idea where they're DMA to. They're just a piece of RTL where you give it some values, you know, via a PCIe driver, and you say, you know, whatever comes in on your Ethernet port, depacketize it and push it like crazy to this address range. That's fine if it's an address range that you've reserved. If that's the kernel stack, bad things are going to happen. If that's the VGA memory map location, you will see some mad shit on your screen. And if that's the blow up the computer, please poke address, then you better make sure you're not in the room, right? So, so the kernel likes to make sure that things are being checked. And right now, if you try to pass in a PCIe bar address for a, a Linux API, it will return an error code. So I'm sorry, that's not, that's not valid. And one of the reasons why that is is because IO memory doesn't have a struct page backing to it. And there's a lot of reasons about why that is. But, but the, main, the main thing we should understand is that right now, I can't set up a DMA engine on an RDMA NIC to push data to a PCIe bar that's somewhere else in the PCIe subsystem. Yes? Um, yeah. Well, they're doing it from user space. So you can use SPDK or a hacked version of SPDK to do this, but the upstream kernel, the one you get from Linus, will not let you do what I just said. Right? So my, my emphasis is I want everybody to benefit from this, and I would like it to be in the upstream kernel. I can do it today with my own hack of the kernel, right? And you could do it with your hack, and you could do it with your hack, and Accelero can do it with theirs. And we can add it to SPDK, and they'll be able to do it there. But this particular conversation is around the Linux kernel, if you see what I mean. So there's nothing physically stopping anybody doing this. 
It's just if you want to do it in an upstream Linux environment, then we have to obviously get it upstream. And they have requirements that things like Accelero don't, right? Because Accelero is probably specific to a couple of architectures, and they're probably willing to do some things that is an operating system is probably not going to let you want to do and stuff like that, right? Around security, IOM, MU, stuff like that. So a little bit of background on some of the things that we use within the kernel. The kernel is open source. I, everybody probably knows where it is. You can go and you know grab the kernel code for some of these things. But some of these are quite important. So zone device uh, is basically the ability for us to take a range of memory addresses, uh, which in Linux are called physical frame numbers, PFNs. So every 4K of memory in Linux basically has a PFN associated with it. And then some of those PFNs have struct page backing, but not all of them. So, I, so PCIe bars may have a, P, well, have a PFN associated with them, but they don't have a struct page in the upstream kernel. Uh, basically, this allows you to introduce memory to the system, but not throw it into the standard memory management system. So this might be even an NVDIM N that you don't want the operating system to use for you know, physical memory allocation in the way that other would, because you're going to mount a file system on it and treat it like a PMEM device or something like that. Right? So in, Intel were actually the guys who introduced that, mainly looking for the Apache Pass NVDIM kind of stuff. Uh, PMEM uh, is basically a, a device driver that lives on top of a range of PFNs and turns it into a block device. So if you want to have a NVDIM block device in your system, one of a few different ways of doing that is to register it as a zone device and then put the PMEM driver on top, you get a block device, and then if you want you can put a file system on top. Just be pretty careful about what file system you put on because some of them don't work so well, <laughs> including ones that actually claim that they did work, like ext4 with DAX. DAX is a framework that we added kind of at the file system layer that says, hey, some of these block devices that you're talking to now aren't actually block devices. They don't have the same sector atomicity that we expect from a block device. They're actually constructed from physical page ranges. And so what DAX allows you to do is to take a file system that's just a normal legacy file system like EST4, and it actually provides a framework to help, and then we thought, we thought it worked, uh, to help actually make it work on physical memory. But surprise, surprise, as you dig into it, you start finding corner cases, and, and there's issues with that. So, but this is the way in which we can upgrade file systems and like ext4 and zfs and all that kind of thing to make them work on an nvdim or to make them work on anything else that looks like a bunch of physical memory. And then struct page support. Um, you, basically, if you want to use the DMA API or some other things to do with memory, it's useful to have this. It's a little bit of metadata for every page of data. So for basically every page uh, in your system, um, and in, in Intel systems, that's 4K. On ARM systems, sometimes it's 4K, sometimes it's 64K. Um, you basically have 64 bytes of metadata that tells you stuff about what that physical metadata is doing. So these are all very much in the plumbing. GitHub, I love GitHub. So anybody who wants to go, it's really long, but anyway. Yeah, you can go to that tree. Um, there's a couple of other trees that are up there, but yeah, Linux P to P mem is where we kind of keep this work right now. Um, it's all just you know GPL license code. Anybody can take it. You can do whatever you like with it. Um, basically, there's a whole bunch of patches. You can't see them all, but we have about 20 patches that sit on top. And right now we're rebased off 4.12.3, so we're based off a of stable. Um, we haven't rebased onto 4.13. We typically rebase on every major, but we haven't done it for a little while, I guess. We've been busy doing a startup. But a uh, whole bunch of code. Uh, and basically what we're doing here is uh, the, the biggest change is, is basically there's, in the section of zone device code I talked about earlier, we've added some additional flags that say, hey, we know you typically don't do this, but we're going to add some new memory in the system. And can you give it struct page backing? And oh, by the way, it's IO memory. Um, and it's a little bit naughty, and we've had some discussions on the, on the kernel community about why that's naughty, but it certainly works. It's just maybe it's not upstreamable. But it does work. Um, you can add some other changes on that. And what we did is we created a new device class called P2P mem. And you can think of P2P mem as like a kernel-wide orchestrator, which is a device in the device tree, 
that drivers can basically either donate memory to or take memory from. And we built it on top of Gen Alloc, which is a standard allocator in the Linux kernel for you know, handing out memory. That's a special type of memory. So basically what we do is we give uh, something like a PCIe driver, a framework that it can call into and say, hey, I have a bar. I don't need this bar. It's not for configuration. It's not for my driver. It's a bar. It's backed by, maybe it's backed by DRAM. Maybe it's backed by Spintorque MRAM. Maybe it's backed by some awesome new memory technology that may or may not eventually appear from Intel. Maybe it's backed by something else, right? It's just a bar. Uh, maybe it's backed by nothing. Maybe it's just fake, right? I mean, you can do that. Uh, I would like to give that memory to the Linux kernel. And I would like other drivers, if they like, to basically do something with that memory. Okay. So the P2P mem becomes basically the, the go-to place to either donate or grab memory from. So you can think about it like that. And it has a character vice. You have slash dev slash P2P mem. And you can go in and do ioctals and open and read and write and stuff like that. Okay. So that's the first step. The next step is you take a PCIe driver, either one you write yourself or you hack one that already exists. I happen to hack the NVMe driver. It's already there. And we have a standard way in NVMe for exposing a bar. It's called, well, originally it was called, no, there's now two ways of doing it. One is controller memory buffer, and the other is persistent memory region. Right? And they're totally standard. There's config registers you can set to advertise if you have a CMB, which bar it's on, does it have an offset, what kind of data can you put in the CBB? And now we have ways of saying that it's a persistent memory region. We have even ways of saying how you guarantee consistency. So we have a mechanism for doing that. That's pretty cool. We can advertise the size of it. Uh, I think we can even advertise things like how long it takes for it to flush on a pail. And we have a way for it to say it's not quite ready yet, even if the rest of the drive is ready. Blah, 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 blah. All right. So one of these changes, and you can just go to GitHub and look at it, takes the NVMe driver and says, and there's not a lot of changes, it's like maybe 10 lines of changes to the NVMe driver, and it says, I, I'm going to look at my CMB registers and see, do I have a bar? And if I have a bar, I'm going to give this much of it to P2P mem. So P2P mem is now aware of it and can give it to somebody else. So that's the mechanism by which suddenly the kernel knows, ah, Stevens just plugged in his lovely new startup's NVMe drive that has a controller memory buffer. And that controller memory buffer supports all data types, and it's this big, and now I, as the kernel, I'm aware of that. I create a gen alloc out of it, and other people can now come to me and do gen alloc requests against the memory, and I can choose to give it to them, or I can say, nope, I'm not giving it to you, because give it to them, or I don't like who you are, or you know, you're not trusted. So the kernel is completely in control here. So P2P mem, basically, um, if we have a bar, um, we can do stuff with it. So what can we do with this? Like, what can we do when we have this? So I'm going to go into a couple of examples. And this isn't just about RDMA. Sorry, guys. It's not just about NVMe. This is any PCIe device that either wants to borrow memory because, or wants to DMA to a, another device or, or, or that has memory that it can donate. Why would you donate some of your memory? Well, let's say we have two NVMe drives and they want to copy data from one to the other. Right, the classic standard way of doing that is this is our setup. We have you know, an Intel server. We have a, the micro semi switch. Um, I used to work for them. Uh, we have some standard NVMe SSDs. This, these do not have CMB, right? These are just standard NVMe SSDs. And then we, in this case here, I actually have a micro semi NVRAM card, which basically has a large bar on it. And it, so it basically becomes a P2P mem device, and the CMB basically gets mapped in. What I can do is I can write some code now um, that says, can you please take a lot of data, like all the data on this drive, and put all of that data on this drive. But don't copy to DRAM and down. Can you copy to this and down? I don't have to change user space at all. It just works. Basically, what happens in user space is the dev, when this CMB appears up here is a slash dev slash P2P mem major number. P2P mem zero, if it's the first one in the system, 
one if it's the second. We have a SysFS framework for working out which P2P man belongs to which CMV. Aaron, you'll be glad to hear. So you know where in the system your memory sits. And you memap that. You open it, you memap that, and you basically use that as your buffer for your read or your pread v or whatever. And everything just starts to work. And what happens is all the data gets copied, but none of it goes up here. So basically what happens is the copy speed is about the same. We're not really seeing a throughput advantage, but the upstream port TLP count and the DRAM requirements go literally 10 orders of magnitude down. So have you noticed any difference in performance Yeah, it's going to suck bad. That's why we want to know where in our PCIe tree the devices are. If, if this switch isn't here and you're directly connected, sometimes it doesn't even fucking work. Right? Because sometimes people's PCIP is so shit that it doesn't let you do peer to peer. And it's not just Intel. I've tested on power. I've tested on ARM. I can't say exactly which ones fail and work. Some of those are under NDA. But let's just say it happens more often than not. So this is going to be something that's maybe going to have to be constrained to switch environments. But all flash arrays and GPU clusters are the kind of places where this might actually be interesting anyway. Right? But definitely something to be cognizant of. And like I said, that's why we have the SysFS, so we can actually troll through the tree. We have got a compatibility function in there, so we can have rules on when P2P is allowed and when it's not. Um, the operating system can step in and impose certain rules on top of that. So there's ways and means that we have about ensuring that it's done only when it should be done. And right now, the rule is basically, if you're both connected to the same switch, OK. If you're not both connected to the same switch, for now, we're saying no. All right, but that's just, that's just a rule. That's a line of code. Right? And the kernel community can decide as a collective what the rules should be or whether we need some kind of maybe you know, some, some other methodology for doing that. So this particular, this particular example involved two DMAs for every movement. Right, This guy DMAs to the buffer. And then this guy does a DMA from the buffer into whatever's behind it, Optane or NAND or SpinTorque. But, but the PCIe bar could live in one of the drives. That's a CMB. Right? So the last example I call the bounce buffer example. We introduce a device that acts as the bounce buffer. But now one of the bounce buffers could be one of the NVMe drives. So one of the drives could have an, a CMB, and the other could not. Right? Um, and that CMB could be a persistent memory region. Right? I'm going to skip the, this slide quickly because it's well, anyway, no, I'm not, because it's kind of a plug. But anyway, we have a device that we're working on. Some of you may have seen the talk on Monday at Edicom. We have an FPGA card that is an NVMe-compliant device, and we've implemented a fully functional CMB. Now, other drives in the market today, there's a couple I've seen now that have CMB, but most of them right now are only supporting submission queues. So we, we did something that would support everything. So that, we did, you know, basically I wanted that to play with in the lab, so, so we did it. Um, and because we're a true CMB, uh, people can DMA to us and then issue an NVMe command that is inside our own bar, and we can detect that, right? We know the PCIe config space. The BIOS has told us the range of our bar. So when the PRP comes in, we do a check and go, is this PRP inside us or outside us? And if it's inside us, we do an internal DMA rather than an external DMA, right? And the thing about that is now I'm actually saving PCIe bandwidth because now I'm able to do copies with one external DMA. So in the last example, I was having to do DMA to there and then DMA back to here. In this example, it's a true CMB. So I can say copy all the data from here and put it on here, assuming I have the capacity to do that, which I, our particular thing doesn't today, but that's just, you know, that could be changed. And, and, and other people will have drives with much bigger capacities and so forth. So what happens is basically this guy does a DMA, the physical address is on the CMB. When it's done, it raises a completion. This guy then triggers the write on this side. This guy detects it's inside the CMB and just sucks it in, and it's done. And in fact, maybe it can acknowledge it immediately because it's power loss protected. It knows everything at that point. We've had this conversation earlier today, right? 
It's like once he gets the completion, or sorry, the submission command realizes everything that that drive needs is already inside of it, it can just do an ACK if it has the physical power save capabilities to guarantee that acknowledgement. So that's kind of cool. And again, it's the same idea. The speed stays the same. The CPU load has gone down orders and orders and orders of magnitude. All right. Only one external DMA. Um, we got some results. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but basically we've been doing a lot of testing with our card. Um, there was some more data on Monday, but basically the CMB can be incredibly fast. It's a very fast path in our particular um, topology. So we can do, you know, if we're saturating PCIe Gen 3 by 8, and we're almost saturating PCIe Gen 3 by 16. So there's a lot of capacity there. Um, I think what's more interesting is, so what else can we do with this framework? Well, we, I've showed you NVMe drives, but let's introduce a different type of device. Let's bring in an RDMA NIC. Um, so now we can move data between NVMe and RDMA. Now, where have we seen NVMe and RDMA get together in a really sexy way recently? Oh, NVMe over fabrics, of course. All right. So this is, uh, I think this would have, would have been an FMS demo if it hadn't set the joint on fire. It wasn't us. It wasn't us. <laughs> uh, so basically, this, this is a, an NVMe over fabrics demo we did with Mellanox and Celestica at FMS. Well, we didn't. Microsemi did, but Microsemi was paying me lots of money. Um, and, and basically, we had a JBOF here. Uh, we had Mellanox CX5s. And what we did is we used the Microsemi NVRAM in this case, and we used it as a P2P mem, and it became the buffer for all the I.O. rather than this DRAM. And basically, we would run in one mode for a few minutes, and then we'd switch to the other mode, and we have counters here, and we could show that basically, you know, in, normal, in both modes, the throughput was the same in terms of IOPS, but again, just orders of magnitude less load here. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's awesome to watch, because it goes literally from like, you know, 10 gigabytes per second to like a, you know, a megabyte per second, depending on the I.O. size, because we still have submission queue entries and completion queue entries and so forth, but the data is now all going from here into here, and then these drives are DMA out of there into their non-volatile memory. So by CPU load, you really mean the load of the screen? I mean, yeah, not, not, not processor core, yeah, not load as in what HTOP reports. Load as... measure the load on this link between the... Yeah, I measure how much traffic is going... measure yeah. the load on the memory. Both. Both order, but it, it, yeah, it's pretty much the same because there's no need. There's no need. Yeah, I have. Well, it, well, we're do. Well, well, we're doing like 20 gigabytes per. Se well, not 20, but like 10 gigabytes per second. So the L3 is going to flush out. I mean, <laughs> we do it for. Okay. You know, it's like how long does it take to fill a 128 megabyte cache at 10, 10 gigabytes per second, right? DDIO doesn't help you here. There's so much data going through the system. Like, what, what, what are you going to do with the 129th megabyte that comes in, right? It's like, basically, it's like the L3 cache is like, it fills, it's like a write-back cache that just fills up instantly. It's exactly the same effect. It's, 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 it's DDIO just doesn't work in that kind of environment for this kind of thing. But we can argue about that, yeah. I can argue. Yeah, yeah. So that was all, to be honest, very exciting. But this is the one that really gets me excited. <laughs> because if you look at all the pieces now, we have RDMA, which gives me low latency, CPU offloaded, remote connection to stuff. I have an, a standard way of exposing a bar and a persistent bar on the PCIe bus now with NVMe. All right, so PMR, NVMe PMRs mean that I can standardly with multiple vendors working to the same spec, go out and buy devices that maybe expose persistent memory that isn't lock-based, it's byte addressable, it's IO memory. I have a Linux-based framework that allows that particular NVMe device to tell the OS what it has. And because of PMR, there's a standard way of also saying that it's persistent, and we can tie that into P2P mem or some other thing to say, hey, the particular attribute of this P2P mem is that it's persistent and it's an NVMe PMR. And so device drivers then can use that to go, okay, well, I know I'm an RDMA NIC, and you've just told me your PMR with a 
flush mechanism that involves writing to a specific address. I know what that address is. I have a DMA engine. I can certainly poke that address. We can, we can do something around guaranteeing data is actually consistent. Right? So rather than it being just a temporary buffer, it can become the way we access the non-volatile memory directly over RDMA. Right? I knew you were going to jump into. <laughs> How did you register that memory? What's that? Modify the, the verbs? What's that? How did you register no, that memory? No, no, that the M. No, that doesn't change. It's the so. But the verbs normally act on a struct page, you know. So that's the change that we did. We changed lower down underneath, and we've given this memory struct page. So you just pass the memory, you just gotta find a handle that points to that memory, which for us is the slash dev slash p2p mem zero. So you literally just open slash dev slash p2p mem, and then you basically mmap it, and then you pass that into IBV register MR. Right? Or for IBV write data, you just, we added a, a, an upstream accepted patch that lets you pass in an mmap option to point, and we just point, so you just do IB underscore write underscore bandwidth dash dash M app slash dev slash P2P mem zero. And it just works. There's no other, no changes needed in lib verbs, no change needed in IB core. Thank you. So this is literally what we're doing. Like I did, I was working on this this morning even. Like we basically, our friends at Mellanox have given us CX5s, we have the micro semi switch, we have the Adeticom no load. Um, you know, right now our, you know, our, our, our PMR is a fake PMR. I, I don't have it, I, but I can go buy MRAM. I, I put it in there, or we can work with Everspin and put it in there. Right? That, that's really, you know, uh, kind of a second order thing. But we, we can advertise as a PMR, and we can basically have it so P2P mem realizes that it's persistent, and it can tell this guy. And then what, what happens over here is basically my application can now use RDMA verbs um, to access this and this PMR could be pretty big. Like, this could be terabytes. I mean, BIOSes might complain, but um, they won't complain for a while. But they, it could certainly be quite big. Right. We could have CMBs and PMRs. We can have CMB and PMR and block devices. We could have NVMe devices that have zero block-based capacity, which I know Amber will slap me for saying. Right. Because you know, NVMe is supposed to be about block. But, but that's kind of where we, where, where we are right now. Um, so we've been doing some experiments. This is pretty early days. We're just starting to get some of this data. But I mean, no surprise that using peer-to-peer -peer instead of going through the DRAM, um, you know, it just means that we're not loading the processor again. So the other advantage, of course, now is that normally what would have happened in RDMA is I would have gone up here, uh, but now I'm going straight here. Right? So this means basically I can do NVDIMs without an NVDIM. I can do it on the PCIe bus if I'm trying to expose over the network. So if you want to do persistent memory over fabrics, you can basically now have a choice. You can go and buy NVDIMs and put them in an RDMA NICs, and that will all work fine. And now you can also go buy PMR-enabled NVMe drives. You can plug those in on a PCIe chassis like a Celestica or like a, a you know, the Unisys or whatever, like an all-flash array essentially, but now it's a persistent memory over fabric all-flash array. You can use P2P mem then to basically access it. And on the client side, it doesn't even know. It doesn't care. It's just using verbs, right? Um, now, it's up to you to find the last little gaps, because <laughs> I know that's what you're really good at. You know, we definitely aren't all the way there. We, we still have some work to do with RDMA around flushes and fencing and, and things like that. <laughs> well, flush, flush isn't so bad because, like I said, PMR, very cleverly, I did the initial PMR, and it's so much better than it was when I started it. So I initially proposed it, and some, like, you, you know, the standards people did the right thing. They went, this isn't what we nearly need. And one of the things they added above what I proposed was, we are going to have a way for the drive to say, this is how you make me persistent. And I guarantee if you do this, if you do whatever it is, and we have different things that you're allowed to do, it's by nature, you yeah. Have a switch with no buffer. Yeah. Yeah, and so one of the methods is basically just read from the bar. If you do a, a, a read from the bar, yeah, that, yeah, exactly. And another one, one says read anywhere in the bar. The other one says you must read from this specific address. And I think there's a few others. I mean, I think yeah. people just fit. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. But, be, but because we're advertising that through a standard driver, we can then pass that information through another standard driver, the RDMA ones, so that the RDMA cards know what to do. <laughs> I got half a tick. I got half a tick. <laughs> yeah. I think the promising one is read from a specific address, mm -hmm. not overloading. Yeah. And compare that to your. Yeah. Yeah. So, what about the ecosystem for PMR? Well, things already exist, so even outside, you know, this week we've had Everspin. They could expose some of their capacity. There's very small capacity, but they could expose that as a bar, and that's a permanent bar. It's backed by SpinTorque MRAM, so that can be a PMR, right? The MicroSemi guys for ages have had this NVRAM card, which is a super cat backed um, NVRAM device. It can expose some of its DRAM as a PMR, and the super cat ensures persistency. You know, we, we're working on a framework. We, we're we're software-centric. We'll deploy on other people's hardware. If that hardware happens to have SpinTorque MRAM or some other kind of memory level persistency, we can expose a PMR as well. And other drive vendors, Toshiba, I know, has talked about PMR. Um, and I'm sure other drive vendors will be going down that path as well. So where are we in terms of upstream? The reality is that we're getting there. Uh, I think this slide is interesting. Basically. There's three steps. You need zone device. We didn't do zone device. Uh, you need P2P mem for the specific architecture. This is not architecture agnostic. And then upstream. So basically where we are is for x86, we have this. We have this, but it's not upstream. Uh, PowerPC have added a zone device. Uh, I haven't tested this, but I'm hoping this is an easy, easy one to, to get to. Because that the problem is right now with ARM, we don't have this one. So I'm having conversations with the ARM people. This is important for ARM anyway, because it's NVDIM support as well. This is how basically tied to memory hot plug. So it seems like this is something ARM64, now that you have Qualcomm and Cavium and so forth doing data center type servers, NVDIM support upstream seems like it would be good for ARM64. So where are we going? Um, back to your point earlier. You know, this, this has been a very Linux-centric stack in terms of what we've done. But we don't have to use Linux. I mean, there's other operating systems, and there's also user space. So SPDK is something that we're thinking about. Like, maybe we do it in SPDK. Um, certainly, if the kernel community continue to say it's not acceptable and we can't go into the kernel, which would very, I'd make me very sad if we can't find any way of making that happen. Um, you know, obviously, this kind of thing is, is the way it would end up going. Uh, we can tie in, I mean, I talked just about RDMA and NVMe, but there's other things like graphic cards. And um, AMD have uh, something called ROCKM, which actually kind of exposes some of the memory on the card. Uh, and that could actually be tied into some of this. Um, and then, of course, in the long term, all of these problems go away because we're just going to use OpenGen CCIX, which is my, my name for that. <laughs> My name for what happens when we're going to get all these silly people with different ideas about the same thing in a room and make sure they just form one standard rather than three. <laughs> That's it. Mark. Yeah. So this is very much for over fabrics, right? It would be pretty foolish, I think, to try and build that for, if you want locally attached persistent memory, don't put it on the PCIe bus. Because the load and stores now have to go all the way out and all the way back, and performance sucks, right? There's, that's why we have DMA engines on PCIe devices. So I would very much suggest, you know, advise people not to build this for local stuff and expect it to work at all, like performantly. Um, so it's really all about the remote stuff, Mark. And I think there, the API is identical to what it is um, for NVDMN, for remote access, right? That's right. Well, Dan says it's even better. <laughs> OK, yeah, so it has ordering. Yeah, that's very true. The other thing, I mean, so I, I think this is a good conversation to have, though, Mark. I think now that the ecosystem is getting to the point where we can see a path to this kind of thing, we need to have SNIA looking at it and going, where are the holes? 
where does the programming model fit into this? Is it just identical? And I think also SNEA needs to be cognizant and telling its members that you do not want to do this for direct attached persistent memory. This is persistent memory over fabrics. That's where it's going to be good. And, and, and you know, don't have people coming to you going, but you said it was going to be awesome, and it's not awesome. Right? Yeah. Uh, I'm curious how this works with uh, PCI non-transparent So that's a good question. The question was, does this work with PCIe non-transparent bridging? It, I, I, so, I mean, I just worked with a guy on NTB bridging switch, like, we did an upstream driver for the micro semi switch for NTB support. And I can't get my head around how, how that ties. I, I, I'm trying to work out what would be broken and what wouldn't be broken. But basically, it should work. I just worry about where on earth the data is going in order to get to where it needs to go. Right? Because, because it should work. Right? It should work. We create a new PCIe bar that's on the switch. right? And so. As long as that's the PFN that's given to the DMA engine, it's going to push it to the switch. And the switch doesn't care whether it came from host memory or somewhere else. It's just going to pass it through, translate it, and send it to whatever the NTB setup destination was. So my feeling is it should work. I actually have the equipment to test it. So that's something that we could do. Yeah. I mean, the yeah. That comes to mind for this is, uh, is yeah. 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 So you, yeah, exactly. So, and we can do interesting things around multicasting as well. To come in from the RDMA, we could actually scatter it out and do all kinds of stuff with it. But yes, yeah, for replication, it's not, it's a pretty interesting idea. Yeah, it may not have to be NTB even, it could just be multicast, but, but NTB would be a lot more, I think, flexible, which is pretty neat. The, the bandwidth went to crap, and sometimes, depending on what you're doing, it, this doesn't even work, and you get a UR, an unsupported request back. So sometimes the PCIe will actually just not even let that TLP through. You know, and, yeah. Yeah, so, yes, so, so, the, I mean, so, so, I mean, this is all Linux kernel code. It's open source. It's not mine. You know, I wrote it, but it's not mine. It's DPL. It's the communities, right? So it's not what I, as a community, we, we need to make some decisions around, are we going to have policies on this? Are we going to enforce them in the kernel? Are we going to expose them to user space so the user space can make some decisions? You know, these are not trivial questions because it's a dangerous thing, right? We're playing with DMA engines and letting them do things that make, you know. So, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if I suggested something and even Linus would step in and say, that it's, are you on, like, was it bad shit acid crazy? I don't know, like, just whatever, which would be great because then I'd have a flame email from Linus and I'd put it on my wall. I'm like, <laughs> I'm, actually, I'm actually important enough that he actually called me an asshole. That's like, <laughs> that's pretty cool, right? It's like a badge of honor, right? Um, you know, so, so, so what we have done in our current version is because um, we basically say if you're both connected to the same switch, you can do this. And if you're not, you can't. And that's what's in our lab right now. But that's not necessarily what's going to go upstream. It's not even necessarily what I'm proposing to put upstream. I'm saying let's have a conversation. And, it, and like I said, maybe it's something the user defines and we have a set of rules and the user just selects level, you know, you can have low security rule, medium security, high security, and depending on what they set, there's many different ways of doing that. And, and as a community, we need to decide. Um, but right now, the one that I find always works is if both the endpoints are on the same switch, it's gonna work. And right now, you know, that's good enough for what I need to do and the experiments that we're doing. Um, and also, the switches are pretty darn expensive and I don't work for MicroSemi anymore. So I can't put five of them chained and see what happens. <laughs> Tom. This is a really interesting thing about um, setting the block size of a NVMe device to zero. Yeah. Was that about the EMR or yeah. the NVMe? So I'm saying, let's imagine you, we now, with the spec we have or will have once everything gets uh, approved, if it does, 
we would be able to build a standard NVMe device that's an NVMe device to the host that has a PMR that's a very large size, several gigabytes, and potentially has no namespaces at all. Well, it has no block storage at all. Basically, if you ask it how many blocks it has to be able to turn into namespaces, it's zero. Yeah, yeah. Now, a memory only device, but nonetheless an NVMe. It's still NVMe. Admin commands, queues. Well, queues become a little more weird because you don't really need queues, right? You need an admin queue. An admin. SRIOV would still work, right? So if you wanted to have different people managing it and splitting it up, yeah, you could virtualize the PMR and give different parts of it to different VMs running on the top of the hypervisor. We get all, and we get all the ecosystem, right? We get two and a half inch servers. We, we know it's going to work. It's NVMe, um, but it's now a memory addressable one. Yeah. And this is where Amber hits me, because well, she's like, yeah. you've taken NVMe. <laughs> right, it's NVMe, but it's not NVMe, right? Yeah, yeah. but, right. but that's, that's like any standard, right? We, as a community, we decide where it goes, right? Well, and, you know, such a device is uh, uh, latency discrepancies, right? It's yeah. Yeah. Because of what it's plugged into. And it depends what it's plugged into. Right. We don't know what it's plugged into well, yet. Yeah, Mac, the memory, it's, so what, by the time PMR is in mass production, it could be plugged into a memory we don't even know exists yet, right? So. Yeah. Would you expose such an attribute? What's that? That's a very good question. I mean, it seems critically important. It's yeah. not ordinary. <laughs> so I don't know if Tom, I don't think Tom's here, but Tom, friend from Toshiba, was pretty involved in PMR, and he already has a proposal for V2 which digs into exactly some of that. We want, to, we want to give more information in a standard way that's related to how the PMR is going to behave in the system. And some of that would be around what type of non-volatile memory is backing this, right? Um, what, what is there? Is it, a, is it a memory type? Is it a huge ton of DRAM, <laughs> right? Which, you know, it's going to, or is it, is it phase chain? Like, I don't think we'll get to the point of saying what type of memory it is. The underlying technology, I was referring to the protocol by which you perform a Um, well, I mean, it's, it's a DMA engine that's doing the read, typically, well, right? Because we're not doing local access. Yeah, but the DMA engine will have the same problem. I mean, the NVMe gets around this problem by saying, please write it. No, I, I, so in our lab, we right now are doing like 14 gigabytes per second reads out of it, out of our CMB. Well, we're not going to get more than 15 because it's like 16 lanes of Gen 3. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Now, if you're doing small, random byte accesses, it's not going to be so good, right? You know, it depends on what type of... That's what applications will do. Well, that's not what they do to a block. You know, it's... it's I, yeah. I don't know that it's memory. It yeah. looks like memory, yeah. but it ain't. That's my, mm -hmm. that's my point. Yeah. So we'll see what... You know, we'll see... Yeah, we've got to see what the implications of that are. This is incredibly, like, I'm literally, we're getting data literally day by day, and I think that will help us understand, is this a cool idea or a sucky idea? And I do think it's interesting to be able to offer people the choice of NVDMN or PCIe, and over a network, it looks identical, and it's all libverbs compliant, and yeah. I do have one other question. Your little example that showed the switch yeah. Um, is there any problem with saturating that switch system stability wise when those guys start using it so heavily? No. no, not system stability wise, otherwise microsemi is in a world of pain, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, microsemi are pretty good at validating so that kind of thing. We're using the CPU's root complex. Yeah. I mean, the switch architecture doesn't really care whether a port is an upstream port or not. Yeah, exactly. And the way, you know, not the... So you don't really have I, someone, someone in the front of this room may have been involved in the architecture of that switch at some point in their career. So you don't have a system integrity QoS issue with it? No, no. I mean, you know, it, it would depend on the, you know, it would depend on the switch. And people would have to go to the different switch vendors and validate that for the workflows that they're interested in, the switch isn't going to start doing blocking. Right? And so people would make demands saying, you know, what is your non-blocking throughput between all these ports, like how is it going to, you know, that's why you have these meetings with the architects and say, I'm not going to buy your switch because it sucks. I'm going to go buy PLX or, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, no, it's very true. Yeah, yeah, and we do have to be careful about that. I think we're out of time, um, and I need to run for the plane, but super thank you very much, everyone. It's been a 